Merry Christmas to all who has celebrated. Um, today is the 26th of December and um, around lunchtime I have tried to take a video outside. Um, at least it was not raining but it was very windy and things were flying around and this was not so good. Um, so I would like to um, take the opportunity to introduce you to the setup here inside. Um, we are here in the living room. Uh, no wind, so <laughs> everything is safe. And tomorrow uh, there is an option to shoot, hopefully, uh, at least the weather forecast tells me so. And then um, we do the shooting outside tomorrow, but everything else can be done inside. And yeah, let's start. Um, it's about the Dacians. So maybe you have noticed that I was building um, a quiver based on the relief uh, from the Trajan's column. Um, and before we go into the details about the quiver and the bow, uh, I would like to um, yeah, read something to you that you can easily find on Wiki. Uh, but nevertheless, you don't need to because yeah, well, I just read it now. Uh, the Dacians uh, were the ancient Indo-European inhabitants of the cultural region of Dacia, located in the area near the Carpathian Mountains and west of Black Sea. Um, this is quite a large area, so they are often considered a subgroup of the Dacians. This area includes mainly the present-day countries of Romania and Moldova, as well as parts of Ukraine, eastern Serbia, northern Bulgaria, Slovakia, Hungary and southern Poland. Um, the Dacians and the related Gete or Getai or Geta spoke the Dacian language, which has a debated relationship with the neighboring Trakian language. Um, who can prove it? <laughs> and maybe a subgroup of it. Dacians were somewhat culturally influenced by the neighboring Scythians and by the Celtic invaders of the 4th century BC. The Scythians arrived there 700 BC. So we are talking uh, of a time before uh, the birth of uh, Christ. But, um, now yeah. um, one of the difficult mythological foundation of Dacian culture is um, the Dacian store their name from a god or legendary archer who appeared as a wolf. And um, the result is the Dacian Draco. Um, this is um, a wolf hat with um, mm, a fluent body, so similar to the, um, the Dracos of the Chinese, yeah, where you have this uh, yeah, vivid body. And it's similar here. So they have used it as far as I'm informed um, at war. So there was the wolf head made of iron on a stick, quite heavy, I think. And um, there was also the option, if I'm not mistaken, to put a small fire into this uh, wolf head so that it was looking more aggressive. And if you ride, I don't know if the fire is still then there <laughs> if you ride, but then if the air flows, through um, the mouth that was open of the wolf, then goes into the body, then the body was moving that way. So quite nice, so I, I like the idea. Um, in the absence of historical records written by the Dacians and Trakians themselves, analysis of their origins depends largely on the remains of material culture. Yeah, what is left after more than a thousand years. No? Um, so I leave out a bit. About the year two, uh, 1000 BC, the Carpatho Danubian countries were inhabited by a northern branch of the Trakians. At the time of the arrival of the Scythians, 700 BC, the Carpatho Danubian Trakians were developing rapidly towards the Iron Age civilization of the West. So they started at the Bronze Age, then developed into the Iron Age. Um, this is important to know. 
Now I leave out a bit more. From roughly 500 BC, the second Iron Age, the Dutchians developed a distinct civilization which was capable of supporting large centralized kingdoms by the 1st century BC and the 1st century AD. And uh, the Trajan column was built around 100 uh, of first or second um, century AD. Yeah, so the, on the uh, Trajan's column, there is, I don't know how large this is, it's quite high, there is um, a relief, relief around um, with more than 60 or so reliefs, mostly showing equipment of um, the Dutchians and others. And um, you can recognize the Dutchian equipment by the um, Dutchian Draco. And um, maybe I show here a picture of the um, a snip, more or less. I think it's um, a plaster um, yeah, replica because um, the, uh, the condition of the column is going worse year by year. And so you see more on the replica than on the column itself. And um, I think this is a quite good picture. And um, then you can see more close-ups of the quivers. And um, the importance that we are now in the Iron Age with the Dutch yards um, leads me to the idea that the rings you can see here um, that separate every segment is made of iron. Um, one of um, the fellow uh, Facebook friends, uh, Valentin, uh, told me that uh, the archers were said to um, swing uh, the, the quivers on each other. And so this must have made a sound. If you um, smash one uh, leather quiver against the other, then there is no significant sound, there is no reason to do it. But if there is a metal, then there is a sense because it's quite loud. And I'll show you in a bit. And furthermore, you see um, segments, and the lower segment is double as high as the other segments. And you see that um, the arrows are just a little bit higher, so it's not a small quiver, it's relatively large, and diameter approximately 10 centimeters and this provides a height then of approximately 70 centimeters. Yeah, and um, you see that um, at several um, quivers it was uh, that you have special um, symbols on each segment. The second was open for variation, but the rest looks quite similar. So I guess they had some kind of um, maybe a stone plate that had been carved and so they could uh, create quivers uh, in a higher frequency than I can do it because, and now we come to mine, my quiver uh, has taken 51 hours to create and uh, one of the reasons is the lacing and I come to this in a few minutes. Um, this leather uh, quiver consists of cowhide, two and a half millimeters. And this has been dyed in a dark brown. Why brown? Um, I think that was a most a likely color. It's relatively easier to dye something in a brown color than in red, blue or, or green or something. Because um, if you, for example, take a black tea, you can dye um, linen or cotton into a brown color. I think this was easier. And by the time it gets darker anyway. Um, for the highlights, I have used golden colors because I think um, that the archers were relatively wealthy, those who had such a quiver. And um, yeah, if they right into war, they want to, to show their wealth and yeah, why not golden? Yeah. And uh, I've read another article that uh, the Dutchians, because of their capability to um, cope with the um, in industry, 
uh, they have been relatively wealthy. Yo, what else? Um, we have inside uh, a black lining leather. It's lamb. And here, the flaps. Uh, first, I had uh, used um, lamp leather. And one moment, I show you the performance. So here, this is the leather. It's soft, yeah. But if you have it on, it doesn't perform like it should. Yeah, you see, it's not, um, it's too stiff. Yeah, um, when you look at the relief, it looks like it's very fluently um, falling around the quiver. It's very soft material. It's nicer. So this one feels nice, but it's not the right material. And uh, that's the reason why I think it was um, a fabric. A very common fabric was linen. Yeah, so they didn't know cotton at that point of time, but linen was very uh, common uh, in the medieval times as well. So they had linen clothing and above that another it was called Jute um, in German. Um, furthermore, the bottom, ah, yeah. there is um, wood, at least for my quiver, and I think it's quite possible and likely that they have it uh, made of wood, because I couldn't see any um, lacing on the rivet, so maybe they would have shown it. And so here you see that um, the wood is has a good fit and is only secured with two nails. The iron rings uh, I have burnished myself with chemicals and uh, now uh, they should be secured against uh, rust. And uh, the next point here is the lacing. Ooh, the lacing. Um, I have made uh, or put a question uh, into the forum at Facebook for the Dutchians and asked what they think was most likely we used uh, to close the quiver here. And um, I put there some examples and most of them liked this lacing or way of lacing. Yeah, trouble is, it's first of all a pain in the ass. You have four millimeters distance between one center of a hole to another center of a hole. So they are very close. I get here a little closer. Yeah, you see that. So you have two and a half holes at each centimeter. Each ring has a width of one centimeter. That means you have troubles to get over this one. You need to bridge it somehow, need to be creative, that you have uh, some kind of woven pattern. Then you come back here, you cannot really continue with the lacing pattern. And then you need to start again. Furthermore, the lacing flattens very strongly my bumps. Maybe you can see it here. There were bumps to secure the ring and the lacing flattens it. I don't think that this was made like this. I think this is nice to look at, but it's not the way they have done it. The lacing took me more than 14 hours. If you have an army, respectively, maybe 100 archers, and only the half of them tells you they need another quiver, you cannot spend 14 hours per each quiver to lace them like this. Now, this can only be done in the spare time or if there is freedom, <laughs> yeah, uh, freedom of peace. And um, yeah, I don't think so, really. But there is another option, which I like much more. Uh, this lacing 14 hours. And I think that this lacing can be done in four hours. There is one hole each centimeter, so you get over the rings very easily because it's the same distance. You can 
uh, see that the edges come very neat and close. The pattern is regular and you see that it doesn't flatten the bumps. I think that this is the most likely lacing they have used. It's easy, it can be done quickly, um, it's uh, material efficient, you need much less material than for this kind of lacing. Uh, for, for this lacing I think this is nice, it's practical and yeah, I like this. And uh, this lacing, yeah, it's impressive, but it's also um, making my quiver a little bit out of shape. Yeah, you see it maybe here. Uh, 14 hours um, are spent on several days, maybe a week. And every day you, you try to pull always the same strength, but the one day it's maybe a bit more and the other day a tiny bit less. And then you have different results. There shouldn't be, but there is. Yeah? Uh, I'm not happy with this kind of lacing. Yeah, if someone wants me to do it like this, uh, okay. Um, I need to spend more time, I need uh, more material, and of course uh, this cannot be done for 400 euros. Um, the other way is much more looking nicely and yeah, it's regular, it's fantastic. I think this is the one. Okay, just in case you want to do it yourself, don't waste your time with this kind of lacing. I think this is no good. But uh, yeah, it's like it is and it was the wish of the group that this would be nice and I've tried it. I managed it and it was really hard because especially um, here in the middle, you need to go through and I was only dealing with the tip of my fingers and to put the needle right, right here, at least to find the hole was, uh, sometimes it took me two minutes to find one hole and there are a lot. Yeah, uh, okay, that was enough about the lacing. Um, these two rings are not required. So um, at first I didn't know how to wear the quiver to the front, to the back, so the relief doesn't show. Um, so this is, if you have the rings here on it, you don't get them off. Yeah, so there is no uh, way for a second chance. You do it onto it and then it's done. So I needed to um, fix the rings up front and uh, that's the reason why I have cautiously um, put here two more rings, but these are not required. These ones are sufficient. Uh, one ring would be sufficient already. Uh, this one secures the second band, and now we come to the ridging. Um, the ridging is made of yak leather. Um, I think it was one and a half millimeters or 1.8 millimeters each. And there are two of it. Uh, glued together and um, you can see it's very easily done and like on the reliefs it was shown only a large band yeah and uh, here there was a ring yeah and the rest you need to guess yourself how they managed it and Christian and uh, Romy from Dab Archery both wear their covers with a shoulder pad and the quiver has a weight of 2.2 kilograms. Relatively heavy because of the iron rings, but I think it's relatively comfortable to wear it like this. And the reason why I have used yak leather is um, because it's soft. Um, the weight is nicely distributed and um, is all over the shoulder, not only on one spot. And if the leather is harder, 
it's not that comfortable because you have it here on the neck, especially in the summertime. In the winter you have a jacket on, this is no problem, but especially in the summertime it would be not that nice. And so you see, it's relatively easy. We have here the fix in between this ring and the main ring. Then there is a belt, two centimeters, that runs from here, here around. And you can adjust the length a bit. And then there is this shoulder belt that runs around the shoulder and is attached here to the main ring. So this is how I have done it. So maybe it's it's matching or maybe they have done it a bit different. Sometimes in the reverse you see it that there is um, a belt running below the ring. So potentially it was like this. So it's a one point ridging more or less. Yeah, you have it like this on the central uh, point, the center of gravity. And it's important that the quiver is not lying uh, horizontally, but upright. This quiver, as you can see, uh, contains currently nine arrows and there's felt inside so that it doesn't rattle. Of course, there is room for more. Yeah, if you take out the felt, uh, then you can put another nine or ten arrows in there, maybe 20 or 22. So it's large, really large. Yeah, the uh, flaps have a gold uh, edge because uh, I wanted to secure um, a fabric. Uh, in case it's ripped off, it's no problem. Um, I would simply do, um, make open this sewing, it's sewed by hand, um, take off the, uh, the linen and glue, uh, glue or sew then the replacement in there. So this is no problem at all. And what you can do with these flaps is take it here, uh, make a knot, knot so, and then the arrows are safe and you can start riding. I think um, that they have place the quiver separately when riding. Um, the shoulder belt is working better if you are uh, going or walking or standing um, or sitting on a horse which is not riding then this is uh, running this is fine but if you are riding then it's going back and down and I think this is no good for the shoulder. Uh, potentially they have then taken it off, hang it on the saddle and uh, then riding, my idea. Okay, uh, one word um, regarding the quiver itself. I th think um, this is the military version and that's why I call it the Dutch Leon military quiver. Um, usually if you um, if you see um, bows or something, findings on a battlefield, it's all findings from soldiers. And um, the military equipment is always a little bit heavier, a little bit more stronger to make it uh, useful for um, the war, for the action that is taking place. Um, for the civil version, I guess there might have been no iron rings on it. Mm, not even wooden rings. Um, I think they would have not simply have it. Maybe, um, yes, um, separations, um, but not with a ring like this. Maybe it was just um, leather for a shape like this, so that they have segments, but no iron rings. Because for a civil um, standard, this would have been too heavy. 2.2 kilogram is heavy and if you have for example a kid or a young guy running around and trying to get some food or play around 2.2 kilograms is too heavy for civil use. One more thing I wanted to uh, show you is um, the hint from 
Valentine that they have um, smashed the quivers at each, other, each others and uh, now I want to show you the effect. So if you have um, a troop um, and a number of archers who do this, this um, can be quite yeah, pushing. Um, the Scottish um, soldiers have their pipes and they are quite loud and this is not as loud as the pipe but uh, yeah could be something um, quite reasonable so yes I think they could have done it and especially if you have it on the shoulder this is easy yeah like this and you just do like this. Okay, this is everything about the quiver. And apart from the quiver, I have created uh, in 2020 or 21 this bracer. Uh, it was before I got um, a very good swivel knife, so that was one with the uh, before. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so it's not. Um, 3D modeled, but nevertheless it's embossed. So we have here um, a Dacian Draco um, pattern from the internet and this is referring to Zaf's logo. Uh, on the inside we have another lining leather in brown, it's a soft leather, and uh, here a stone. Um, I don't know which one it is. Uh, it's a nice one matching the colors. And we see here that I have brown colors with golden touch and bronze touch as well. Uh, the fur is uh, rabbit. And then you put it on. So these are horn um, buttons. And usually you have it like this. And that's the reason why the bow is usually not touching. Um, at that point of time when I have used bracers, I was doing sideways cutter. Um, if you do the forward cutter, you could touch the bracer. But uh, yeah, nowadays I don't use a bracer anymore. And uh, sometimes I touch myself, then I have done a mistake and that reminds me to do it properly. So this is how it should look like. Um, instead of a stone like this, um, I could have put um, a thin knife here at, uh, as well. So you can, like a throwing knife, and just put it out of... <laughs> ideas of ideas. Okay, that's how you can use a bracer as well. Now, it's about the bow. This is my Dacian. It has a nominal strength of 33 pounds at 28 inches. Um, a length unstrung 55, 51, let me, oh, don't let me lie. 55, 55 inches, uh, strung 49. Um, the brace height is 6.5 inches. It has a fast light spring, came also with the dark home spring, but I used the fast light. I have added um, a Rex Canine here, fur, and um, we have an arrow pass of 21 millimeters width. Um, the Dias have a length both 7 inches, so it's a mid-sized bow and small Dias. Um, the grain per pound um, arrow weight could be according to bamboo archery table 11, but I think mine is also good. If you want to be on the safe side, ask Romy from Zaf Archery. Um, we have a weight of 400 gram and a max draw of 30 inches. Um, what else? Mm -hmm. I think I have covered everything in materials. This is walnut hardwood in grey and brown. And funnily enough, I didn't look that up before, I have used walnut for the bottom of my quiver as well. We have an overlay of cork and um, yeah, and a stable core inside. 
They are very nice and rounded. Zia, as you can see here, it's very nice. Um, the quality is very good. So if you touch it, there is no edge, no flaw or whatsoever. It's everywhere it's soft and rounded and awesome. You see here the shape of the, the handle fitting my hand very nicely. You see that I have shot this bow ambidextrously. Nowadays I only do it on this one. And to double check the strength of today, tomorrow I will shoot. Um, I'll let you know if there is a deviation, uh, but for today, this is 28 inches, 29, 30. We have here on the back, oh, didn't measure. Okay. 35.2. Humidity here inside is 48%. And the next door, 39.86. Okay, and sound of the bow. Very nice, it's dampened because of the fur and um, vibration. So, a uh, little bit of, bit of vibration, tuck, it's gone. Yeah, so it's really nice and um, shooting wise the bow is silent. All right, then see you tomorrow at the shooting. Thank you. And I hope it was not too boring. <laughs>30 inches. Okay, just a moment, do this again. Here we are. 39.48. Okay. Um, I put this away. So usually we do the first shots. Uh, these are the first shots of today. Um, I know already which um, arrows I like to shoot with this bow. And these are upweighted um, Neura Bark 700 um, with around 440 or 440 grain weight. recently um, with Armin who has um, um, shown the fast shooting method or rain shower shooting not rain shooting shower shooting um, yeah I think um, shower shooting is not possible uh, with this if you pull um, the arrow out of the quiver then you need to pull a few out of them. 
I'm not shooting fast indeed. But I like the method, at least the third one. Spring is always a bit turning a bit. And here are light weighted ones. They have um, a weight of 207 grain. Uh, this is much lighter. Um, let's see, what is it? 200, 25. Um, it's very less, so we, we try nevertheless. You see? Have you heard it? Um, the bow is very loud then. Um, he doesn't like the lightweighted spine. Um, the lightweighted arrows. The spine here is 600, so um, I try to get some weight so here is nothing inside. It's the original weight of the arrow, but uh, the bow doesn't like it. So we keep them in the quiver. I'll show you the results. So you see it's a bit windy here. These were the first shots, these are the last three, and this was the lightweight. Filling the quiver is easy. As you can see, um, like this. I have here the felt inside and um, it provides me some uh, spacers and now I can just grab them and put it in here let's slide in fill it <laughs> um, benefit of uh, this quiver is that you can arrange the position of the quiver just by moving the shoulder belt a bit and then you have it in another position that is maybe more convenient and of course you can grab a few and then this method and then you do not take it take every uh, arrow from the clip this was part of the half Before, uh, I have always grabbed the arrows here and was uh, said to grab it around at the half of the arrow, then pull it against the bow, feel, yeah, okay, and then this was too much left. <laughs> but uh, this is fun. Um, training this fast shooting or shower shooting method um, is fun because you focus a lot on what you're doing and uh, sometimes the result is even better. I'm not uh, a fast shooting archer because um, I like archery because um, you can calm down focus so for me this is stress relief and shooting fast is a bit stressful at least for me it is for others it's fun so uh, i like to do it slow and for me this is fun Something is 
The uh, first two times before that, I think um, the string was hitting something. Don't know if it was the blazer or the jacket, um, but that was the loud noise. And the last time I avoided it because I have placed the arm a little different and then it was better. Test with 408 grain heavy arrows. Uh, grain per pound is noted in the table. Hundred fifty nine. Oops. Hundred sixty. Hundred fifty eight. I think the result is very good. Um, the grain per pound is more than ten grain, uh, yeah, more than ten, and uh, means it's relatively heavy. I think that the bow can be shot with nine grain per pound. And to compare it uh, with other speed tests, for example, for the Turkish yeah, see. Korean, you have 9 grain per pound. I will just calculate it on the base at 9 grain per pound so that you can see the reference where the bow is, if, it, if I would have shot it with 9 grain per pound. Um, the 200 is too light, hard to light, and this is not good for the bow, so I do this only per calculation. Resume. What do I think of my Dacian set? <laughs> First of all, since I have this bow for a few years now, so approximately three years, um, it's an awesome bow. Uh, I like um, the colors. Uh, it's yeah, it's some kind of distinct bow. Um, it shoots like a charm. The sound is nice. The shapes are nice. Uh, the handle feels good. Uh, I never got any bruises, even with the ring on my finger. Um, it's just awesome. It's flawless uh, and still in excellent condition after a few years and I shoot this bow relatively often. Um, regarding the quiver, at first I thought, wow, it would get very heavy and uncomfortable to wear. Um, yes, I have relatively often uh, that my back is not fine and shoulders cannot hold very That's much a good one. but um, I'm not out here for I don't know what time it is um, but this is no no problem at all so the 2.2 kilogram here with the quiver and with this shoulder belt is very comfortable um, this soft leather this yak leather is very nice um, it provides a good um, distribution of the weight on a larger surface and um, so for me this is no problem for me and I think for a man uh, it's no problem at all. Um, the quiver works very nicely so you have um, you have it always a bit swinging around so if you want to have it fixed like the Koreans have um, you will think oh but on the other hand uh, it gives you a lot of um, variety. Yeah, you can hold it like this if you want to go through a door. If you want to go downstairs, you can pull it down or push it down. Um, you can put it on the back. You can get it on the front. Uh, however, you need it at this very moment. And if you want to um, to uh, bend down, you just hold the quiver a little bit 
backwards so that he doesn't come to the front. Yeah, but this is um, no no problem at all. Um, the wearing is similar to the um, Hungarian or Steppe quiver um, from the 10th century. Uh, so the Steppe quiver, for those who do not know, is made of wood. Um, and there is no felt inside, so it's relatively loud. Um, better you put some felt inside, so to reduce the, um, the noise. And it's all wood. Uh, it's not uncomfortable, but it's harder. So if you have now this leather against your leg, this is no berries, no problem. Um, the rings are nice too. Um, they don't hurt. And um, I can imagine to put this on the back as well, but uh, not with this belt. Um, yeah, works very nicely. So yes, I think um, this is uh, a working, let's say, relief inspired build. I don't call it a replica because then I would have needed to use other colors or uh, I wouldn't have been um, able to use acrylics and the typical dye paint we have here. Um, I could not have used um, the uh, yeah the, the um, vanish that uh, we use nowadays. Uh, so all this I couldn't have done or use um, rub and buff for the edges. Um, so there is a little bit uh, of modern materials in it, but I think similar to this um, it was working and of course um, a different lacing I suppose yeah uh, that's it for today and as you may have noticed um, the brazer if I have it or not it doesn't make any difference so usually I do not use it anymore but uh, for today for this video I wanted to use it again <laughs> okay Thank you very much for watching and thank you Omi for building these brilliant bows so I love this bow a lot and um, yeah looking forward to my next Dutch yarn and what else uh, I hope you have enjoyed it um, it's the last video of this year um, next year is another year and maybe then I maybe I do something different my husband has a drone no, who knows? Um, anyway, thank you everybody for watching and um, for your nice comments that that are always. I love every comment, so thank you very much. Wish everybody a good start into the next year. Um, all the best, and hopefully we'll have some more peace for 2024. Thank you guys. Bye bye.